radical transformation. See, um, one thing I really care about probably more than most things is, uh, yeah, sure, I want great praise and I want the presence of God. But ultimately, um, God's heart is for our transformation, to be more like him, to look like him, to, to abound like him, to be able to walk like him. And uh, so there's not too much more important to me than seeing you guys be transformed into the image of Christ. I mean, sure, we all have our own image, but we need to be careful with our individuality that it don't individual us away from Jesus. You know, we're, we're, it's kind of funny because I talk so much about the value of being yourself that sometimes I realize we just swing way too far to this side and we forget we're first supposed to look like Jesus. You know, your persona is still going to be there, but ultimately your deep desire should be Jesus, right? And so um, we're talking about reformation of belonging and specifically around sonship. And I talked about sonship a lot, uh, but specifically today, at least if the Holy Spirit doesn't sideline my message again, um, which is awesome. I wasn't, I thought it was awesome that, you know, the Lord, the Lord would change things kind of to, to extend his heart but sonship is a topic where we think about us being sons but the true sonship that has to be realized before we can realize what great sons we are is to realize what a great son Christ was Jesus Christ was the ultimate son and that son paid the ultimate price because you were so valuable in other words your value uh, is determined or, or all value all value in life just basic economics is that the value of something is the price that somebody's willing to pay for it. So if if you say, what's the fair market value of your house? You would look at what people have paid for the exact same house, and that would be your appraised value based on what people say that kind of house is worth. What the va- like a, ho- a house in that condition with that much square footage, with that many bedrooms and baths is worth this much money. Well, here's the thing. All things in life are based on the value in which somebody's willing to pay. You could say, I think, there's a lot of people that you'll say, hey, how much do you think your house is worth? Well, I think my house is worth 500,000. But if somebody only wants to pay 300,000, it really is nice that you think that much of your house, just nobody else will pay it. So the difference between fair market value and your value is it, like, it's what everybody else perceives. So this is the, this is the important thing. God himself saw your value, and then he paid the price of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for you because of your value. In other words, his price was equivalent to how much value you had. And so that's important because if we realize what an amazing son he is, he'll be saying, he, it said, if a seed goes into the ground and dies, it'll bring forth much more. He was the seed of a son God planted in the earth So many more sons and daughters would raise up in the earth. He was the son that was planted. So many would come forth. And that's exactly the plan that God had from the foundation of the earth. And he he was an example of God's love to us. So um, let's see, I'm going to skip a little bit from this morning. But I want to just say that it is pretty impressive to think about God with us, Emmanuel, being the only begotten son, and he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, which basically meant before uh, the, the devil made Eve do it, and Eve made Adam do it, and everybody had blame for everything else that everybody did wrong. Before all that mess happened, God already foreknew, and he put his son on the cross before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. And you say, well, if he knew it was going to happen, why did he let it happen? Well, something interesting God did when he made us, he made us in his image. And he doesn't really need to answer to anybody. He's got a free will to do what he wants to do. And he gave us that same free will. So because we have a free will, we get to choose whether we're going to serve ourselves or serve the Lord with gladness. Serve love. Ser- serve others. And, and when we begin to step into that, we see the value of that. Last Last week we talked about the two trees and we talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And it was really cool because somebody this week came to me and said, you know, this thing's been making me feel this way 
And it was cool because he wasn't talking about right and wrong, but instead he was talking about the perspective of what is this life, that what are these things that I'm doing profiting me? And he was talking in terms of what the faith really should look like. It's not about legalism, but instead it's about, it's about abounding in good works and good things for God. It's about when you get to see him, what are you going to have to say thank you for your life? Because ultimately, you know, the crowns that we have, all the promises and all the things that we get to attain and the talents that he, we, he gives us five and we had five and we multiplied them. All the things that he gives us all at the end of the day, when we see him, we're going to be like, ah, I think this all belongs to you. Because all I did was walk out the life that you gave. I started with a life that was on my own path to destruction and damnation. And because I was on that path. The, the Lord saw it fit to intercept my path and walk my path out to the cross. And he gave me his path, which was going to glory and to glorify God. And so I began to, I basically took on his life and he took on my life. And basically we completely switched roles. You ever seen a movie like that where the, 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 the homeless guy and the prince and then they just switch roles and, the, and uh, it's, just, it's just a wild story, but it's actually true. It's actually our story, isn't it? We became princes while he became poor. And so this is, this is really interesting. Um, he was born of a virgin, and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And the only reason I'm repeating this is because it's important that everybody in the room gets the concept that sins are passed through fathers, not mothers. Sins are passed down from fathers. And uh, I, I actually studied it out, and I didn't go into depth in the morning. But basically, sin is passed down from fathers into generations to those who hate him. To ho those who hate the Lord is what it actually says in uh, Exodus. So literally, uh, I, I heard this story, and I think it's pretty amazing. There were two sons of an alcoholic. The first son said, well, I'm an alcoholic because my dad was an alcoholic. And then they were like, wow, that's, that's just crazy how that happened. Then they went to the other son and they said, why have you never touched alcohol in your life? And that son said, well, I've never touched alcohol because my dad was an alcoholic. The same two sons had the same dad, but one chose to live after the same sin that his dad walked after. Even though he saw the ramifications, he chose the same path. While the other son said, that is a path of destruction. That's a path that I don't ever want to have in my life. That's a path that I think is foolishness. And so they, two sons saw the same example but chose their own outcome based on the fact that they choose either to obey their father's sins or they chose, no, I'm going to go the way of God. And so it's really awesome because my kids have seen co all kinds of crazy. They've seen all kinds of crazy. Some people shield their kids. Our kids got stuck in the fire. Our kids got stuck in the fire. Our kids got uh, all had all kinds of people around them. But you know what our kids learned? Those people are crazy. What is wrong with them? Our kids, when they see people uh, walking selfish and living for themselves, the first thing they're wondering is, what is wrong with those people? Like, they have kids. What are they doing? Like, they say responsible things. And I'm like, I know I didn't teach them all that. They just watched and learned, and they saw the direction we were headed, and they saw the direction others were headed, and they were able to make their own choices. So I, I believe uh, if you know the stories that come out when you overprotect your kids, ultimately they just don't even, they think they're missing out on something. Do not overprotect your kids. Take them out, take them out crazy places and minister. Show them what the other side's life be like because at the end of the day, they're just going to wonder why you kept it from them. And they're, they're going to, because the enemy will play on that all day. So um, that's a really, really, I think it's a, it's a good way. Some people are, really don't like that, but that's just our story. And so it's funny that um, I'm going to read out of Matthew 1 about, actually, I'm, I'm just going to quote that one. Yeah, Matthew one twenty three says that Jesus grew in favor. Hold on, let me read it, actually. 
Sorry, that's Luke 2, 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, this is important because Jesus actually had development stages. Jesus was born like a baby in a, and there was no room for him. It's interesting that the Son of God had no place for him. It's also interesting, you know, like everybody thought when you read about Jesus, it says he has no comeliness that we uh, should admonish him or, or should desire him. Well, that word means literally there was nothing outside external that would be attracting us. He, he didn't have like flair. He didn't have, he, he wasn't like John the Baptist where people were like, man, this guy, was, you know, they were, they were drawn to him because of his, his, his ways, you know, even though he was, he was just a Nazarite that, that, that lived holy. He was doing all these things. And Jesus comes on scene. They're like, if you looked at him, uh, Isaiah's quoting through a prophetic vision that he has no comeliness that we should desire him. In other words, his, he's not looking like somebody spectacular. You know, the outside of the tabernacle was all badger skins, but inside's all the gold. Handcrafted gold. I mean, the the whole um, Ark of the Covenant, the whole, the seraphim are beaten out of one piece of gold into this majestic angels. And, and so the smiths that were taken uh, to do this kind of articulate work, they, they produced something that was completely magnificent, but it's all hidden from the outside. It's all plain on the outside, looking like badger skins, and I don't know, why would you live for that? Outside, no one knows. The, it's com it completely confounds the wise, because the wise look from eyes outside, looking in, and, and then those who need need the Lord, those who want the Lord, those who pursue the Lord, those that are after his secrets, they get to discover the gold inside. Amen? Amen. So, here we go. In Ephesians 2, let's read. Ephesians 2. This is all the stuff I skipped in the morning. Let's see what the Lord has to say. Ephesians 2, verse 14. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your word. For he himself is our peace. Who has made the two become one? He has torn down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. He did this to create in himself one new man out of the two, make, thus making peace and reconciling both of them to God in one body through the cross, by which he extinguished their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who were near. For, the, the, or for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Verse 19. Therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is fit together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you too are being built together in a dwelling place for God in his spirit. Amen. So it starts out with this concept. Jesus came into the world through a virgin who was sinless. And this is why it's important because no one that's born of man is sinless. You are born, we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, which means iniquity, uh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of natural life. Are, are coming at us daily to try to twist us from the very plans that God has for us. And that's why people can even be in the church, they can prophesy, but they're prophesying out of selfish motives. They're prophesying out of soulish motives or desires that they have. And God wants us to completely shift our focus because ultimately our hearts should be so in alignment with his desires. Not just his desires for us. Like, what does God have for me? Well, first of all, you're asking the wrong question. Because if you put you in the equation that early on, before you really know him, 
you're going to still be asking about you. We shouldn't be asking what's God's desires for me. We should be asking what's God's desires, period. In other words, what does God want? Not what does God want for me, because if I find out what God wants, I can find out what God wants for me. But i got to first be willing to find out what God wants. What's God's desire? What does God like? I'll tell you what, some, so many people are trying to find God's will, but God's will's in the center of his ways. His ways are more important than his will. If you're hitting the center of his ways, you're going to automatically hit the center of his will. Because all he's really looking for is for us to have his heart. He, he didn't die for us to go, go be some radical evangelist someplace. He died for us to be sons and manifest the kingdom everywhere. If you're thinking about manifesting the kingdom in Zimbabwe, but you haven't manifested the kingdom in Walmart, what are you thinking you're going to do in Zimbabwe? Like, it's silly how we think sometimes, and I know this firsthand. My, my thoughts about how I was going to arrive to some place were very twisted from what God's actual desires are, were for me. And so, he himself is our peace, it says this at the beginning, and he made the two one, and he tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Now, the word, language like this, especially in the New Testament, can become confusing. Because why is God hostile? I thought you're loving, man. <laughs> Jesus is loving. But he was hostile against sin, wasn't he? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you have, if you know somebody's hostile at something that you love, you're going to feel like he's hostile towards you. And this is where it's really important because the people in the world, especially if they're in darkness still and don't know the Lord, but even in the church sometimes, when you poke at things that they love, they think you're poking at them. In other words, they take personal what you're saying because that's something that I love. I was thinking about it this way. If I take the two kids that had the alcoholic father, the father gets delivered, and he's like, I want my kids to live right now. But you got the one son that's the alcoholic, and you got the other son trying to live right and do the right things and go to school on time and, and finish college. But this son keeps this son and keeps, uh, keeps bringing him down. Now, you could use that in different terms, but I think family works really well because people understand family. If you don't have children yet, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but I guarantee you get this analogy. So you have two kids, and one, one child is act absolutely going after the right things that you want them to as a parent. Now, I know we're not supposed to live our dreams to our kids, but, but you know what's best for your kids oftentimes. And then the other child does whatever he wants and kind of even brings turbulence into that family. Well, the funny thing about it is if you're a father and you're trying to figure out how you're going to help your children, the first thing you're going to have to figure out is how can I protect my one son from the influences of my other son. That's hostility. Are you really not loving your one son? Or are you not liking the things that's from the one son trying to bring down the other son? But when you step in and try to separate the two sons, this son is going to automatically feel rejection. He's going to feel like you love my brother, but you don't love me. And see, this is what we face in the world because people don't really all get that they're loved together. God doesn't love us because we're in the church more than he loves the world. He, he actually has no ability to be partial. God can't love you better on your good days. That, and you prayed and you fasted and you, you're, you're in love with God and you're doing all the right things. He can't love you better on those days. And then when you're... Uh, like, oh, well, this week they messed up. I'm going to have to push the smite button again. Like, he's not the whole almighty smiter. But some people feel that way about God because of their uh, understanding of how people think. Fallen man thinks. And so, it's, if we just get this, this right, we get to see God is hostile towards division. He's hostile toward things that divide us from him. He wants us to be knit together with him and so he sent his son to de to demolish the dividing wall now just because we we're already talking about the tabernacle the wall between the holy of holies and the holy place there was there was three places right 
when you first come into the temple through the badger skins, this is the place where sacrifice happens. There's a place of sacrifice. There's an there's altar there. And then they go from the altar. And then there's a laver where you wash your hands. That represents the word of God. And there's a mirror in there. And you see uh, imp- you know, these kind of implications in the book of James. When they look in the perfect law of liberty, they look in the mirror. A man that looks in the mirror, walks away, forgets what manner of man he is. The Bible is not supposed to tell you how sinful you are anymore. It was before Christ. Watch this. Uh, you look at the man in the mirror, B.C., and you see, oh, my gosh, I am so sinful, I need a Savior. And then you look at the mir- same mirror, A.D., after you died. That's your crossover. Now you look at the law of, you look into the mirror, the word of God, and it's supposed to be giving you the law of liberty. And this is how we know church people still looking at this side of the mirror. Because they talk like condemned people condemning people. Like we're condemning behaviors and stuff instead of calling people, reaching through the mirror and saying you need to see yourself on this side. You need to see yourself in the view of life, in the light of God, in the love of of the Father. And when you start to see yourself from this view, it just illuminates your heart. So the Spirit of the Lord is building up his temple, and his temple is is comprised of the uh, apostles and prophets and Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. He's made a foundation for us to set our building on, and he's fit us together as a holy temple. Now, God is building his house. And what we need to do is just say, yes, God, I want to be who you called me to be. Which is going to be, first of all, God, I want to be just like you. Just pursue that for a while. Like, I don't know, 50 years. Just pursue that for a while. And after you pursue that for long, you'll find yourself in the exact place, the exact will, the exact plans that God has for you. So many people I know get frustrated because they're trying to figure out what God's trying to do in their life. And ultimately, it's not that complex. If you follow God, he'll get you where you need to be. You know, Peter's in some crazy vision up on a a roof and gets his trance and gets his uh, sheet gets laid down. And God starts talking to him. He's like, that's crazy talk, God. I'd never do that. Now. That's funny that God would say something that we don't necessarily think is God. If you really study scriptures, you'll find out God is constantly challenging our own paradigms. We have to never let our understanding or our paradigm become God. And this happens a lot. I hear people talking out of their soul about what God says. Do you know God doesn't speak to your soul? God speaks to your heart. And then that has to bubble through a some layers, if you're not in prayer, it has to bubble up. And, and if, you, if you're not careful, you'll hear yourself talk back and say, that's God talk. And the reason why I, I just challenge you guys for this is know the word, know what God's like, and then you won't get confused on what God's even saying. God, God's not about uh, separating you from, from, uh, from people unless they're d- damaging you. Like, I get it. If I, if I can't pull you out of the mire, guess what? I need to just let you stay there and, let, and pray that somebody else is sent. Because I had a lot of friends I had to let go of when I got saved. Amen? And so, let's turn to John 15. We're going to get into the scripture. And I'm just going to share a couple, couple quick points about this. So, God has some characteristics. I was uh, looking at this book out of, uh, from A.W. Tozer. And he had ten characteristics of God. I... I decided I wanted to emphasize five characteristics of God. Um, one of them is that God is love. God is love. We got that down? Everybody got it? Then why when we hear God talk, our, our, and it sounds like God's upset. Love can be upset, but it would never be upset with me. Love can be upset, but it would never be upset with me. He might chasten those who, lo- who he loves, But he's not going to do it out of anger. He's never angry at me. Jesus took the wrath of God on the cross. Let's clarify. 
Jesus took the full wrath of God on the cross. Why, why did Jesus not want to go on the cross? Yeah, it's painful. No, Jesus didn't want to take the wrath of the Father knowing that he lived a perfect life. Jesus didn't want to endure separation from God by letting mankind sin go on him and feeling separation that man had walked in all their life. And so he's like, I don't want what they have. And God's like, this is the way I have for you. Let this cup pass from me. Well, go see if your boys can even pray an hour. They can't. They don't have the ability because they haven't been illuminated. And so he is love. He is good. Amen. If, if the voice of God in your life doesn't sound good, then it's not coming from heaven. Uh, if if the vo- uh, God is all powerful, uh, some say omnipotence. The word omnipotence usually used there. He's all powerful. And uh, this is where, let, let me just go through the other ones. He's all knowing. That's omniscient. And he's all present, which is omnipresent. And uh, these, these terms really are important because what it means is God is always there. Okay? All present means God is always there. You can never be alone. You can never be alone. If you feel like you're alone, it's because you want human companionship and not God. Because he's always there. He's always there. He's also known as Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is here and the Lord is there. He's all present, right? So the Lord is present. The Lord is powerful. And here's a... What people like to question God's power when they say things like, well, if God was all-knowing and all-powerful, why did he let stuff happen? Well, because he let man rule. If we took responsibility, it would go a long way in our lives. Like, if man took responsibility and stopped blaming God for bad stuff happening, we would go a long way in life. Because ultimately, I mess up the things that I'm now blaming God for and wonder, well, if you were so powerful, why did you let this happen? Because I let it happen. It happened on my watch. It happened because of the way I treated people. And so when I, when I take responsibility, I find that I'm not a victim anymore. And I can actually become uh, more tutored by the Holy Spirit. The, how many people want to be tutored by the Holy Spirit? He promised he would. So now all we have to do is say, yes, Lord. Amen. So, so. The attitude of a sonship we read in uh, Philippians 2 was, was really awesome. Um, and it's, it's about God's servanthood. God is all about, can, can, I just got to say this, hopefully I don't cry again. Um, I don't mind crying, but it was nuts. Um, um, go, Almighty God came into the world. And it said his own, like, rejected him. His own people, the people who he came to that knew him the best, the people that knew him the best rejected him the most. And here he is, uh, instead of, like, when he, he tried to get the people that were supposed to be ready for his return, they only mocked and criticized. In fact, they eventually killed him. That's why Peter's acts... The story that he quoted in Acts burned the hearts of the people because it was basically like, you crucified the Lord of glory. There was no doubt what just happened. He basically put it on them, and it says their hearts were burning, and the Holy Spirit just took over. And and literally, Jesus came to his own, his own received him not. Now, this is the powerful part. Almighty God, who's creator of heavens and earth, here he is. Stepping in to earth in an earth suit. He puts on limitation purposefully so he can be 100% man with 100% God. So he can live out the walk that he actually created us to live. Now, if he created us to live this, then he puts on that limitation. And when he puts on the limitation, then he exemplifies what that limitation was there for. He begins to serve. Jesus didn't come to be a uh, grand poobah. He didn't. He is the high priest. He is the apostle of our faith. But guess what? He didn't come to be that. He became that because of the way he served. 
it says, because of his stewardship, because of his servanthood, therefore God had highly exalted him and given him a name above all names. See, the name came because he chose the path of the Father. The Father's path is down, lower, 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 humbler, down, down. Everybody else is going up. What about my destiny? What about my purposes? What about my plans? God's saying, no, lower, lower, lower. And he's saying, what, what, you got to go my way if you want my kind of exaltation. I don't exalt the ones that are trying to go their way, that have their own plans. And so it's, it's, it's very contradictory. And it's, it's like in my heart, I've been, I've been chewing on this for a while because I've been dealing with this reality that God and I are one. Jesus and God were one. God didn't just love the part. God wasn't one with the part of Jesus the same way we had the illustration where Jesus and the person were in a union. Jesus was all the person's darkness, all the person's good qualities. And that person got to partake of all Jesus' divine qualities. The same way Jesus, as in union, walking with the Father, that they're one, that union became his full access to heaven, but it still had to come through an earthen vessel. And the earthen vessel, many times you'll see that, that God took him through a path that didn't seem like it was the right direction. And it just ended up where God wanted him to be. You know, <laughs> a great example I love in the scriptures are that Jesus comes to, uh, to some Pharisees. The Pharisees invite him over. Uh, and they, they're having a little script, scripture time and, and uh, some fellowship time. They're still trying to figure out who he really is. And is he a Messiah, a lunatic, a teacher, just a miracle worker? And as they're trying to figure out that, guess what? We're still trying to figure that out, some people in the world. How far is Jesus? Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. He's the Son of God. And we, we know that. But can we proclaim it? There's a difference between knowing it in the safety of our friends and not denying him out there and saying, yeah, Jesus, you know, you, you think he's a good guy. That's cool. No, say what you believe. If they could say he's a good guy, you should be able to say, I think he's the son of God. Make it plain. Make it plain. So while they're having their discussion, they're trying to figure out who this guy is. This lady breaks into the meeting, the house meeting, and she begins to wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. Now, you know, these guys were, were going, going um, bare, barefoot or with, with sandals, and their feet were filthy. And Jesus said, you know, as Jesus is sitting there realizing this lady's transformation, He's looking at this lady's repentance, this lady's transformation, and he's thinking of the beauty, and all he can hear in his heart is the voices in the room about what they think about him, letting her, him touch her, or her, letting her touch him. Shouldn't the, if he's really a prophet, shouldn't he know this streetwalker is now in here touching his feet? He, if he was really a prophet, he can tell even by the outfit, but he doesn't even care he just lets anybody touch on him. And I'm telling you this, from the outside, they seem right in their own eyes. And Jesus says, wow, when I came to your house, you didn't even wash my feet like you did everyone else that came in your house. You, they came in your house, and you washed their feet, and you said, oh, Grand Pooba, sit over here. And then I came, you were just like, oh, hey, what's up? Just sit, sit over there. Didn't even have any honor for him. But here comes someone off the streets, a streetwalker, and she basically washes his feet with her hair. So think about it this way. Jesus oftentimes would give an insight into the people around him, even knowing their voices still lived out, walked out the love of God. And basically said, this woman has honored me when none of you would even honor me. God actually, God will honor you. Listen to this. God will honor you. When no one else is. When everyone that should honor you doesn't honor you, guess what? God will send someone to honor you. God will find someone. He'll pull them out. And you might say, well, God, this, isn't, uh, this is kind of embarrassing. 
could you imagine being in the, you know, if, if somebody busted, like you were preaching, not me, because I'll put you in my shoes, and then somebody walks in off the street that you really uh, helped, helped transform their life, and they came in here and began to, uh, and they looked a little bit uh, like they just came off the street, you know, and they came down and started uh, crying on your feet right in front of your whole congregation. And that's just nothing compared to, like, these are rabbi, studious guys that, that are really uh, judging. You know, my wife and I were the, were the, were the pretty radicals in our church. Uh, I remember one time we were going down Patapsco Avenue, and we, we, we pulled over, and this lady was there. And my wife says, uh, what are you doing? And she says, I'm just looking to make some money. And she said, oh, okay, you're trying to make some money? H- how much do you usually uh, make? And she goes, because you, go, you can go to church for, with me for three hours and I'll pay you. And so she took this lady off Patapsco Avenue that was obviously tricking, just to keep it PG, and uh, brought her to church and, and paid the lady when she dropped her off. Because she wanted the lady to experience some other kind of love than the selfish kind of love that just tries to get its way for whatever uh, kind of money. And, and here's the thing, guys, you know. People didn't understand us. They still don't really understand us, but, you know, if we don't understand us, <laughs> that's true. And, and, and the reality is that we just want to say yes to God. We just want to say yes to the Father. I mean, we, wouldn't, we don't go and do that every week, you know. It's not like our ministry. Like, everybody thinks, you sure, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's not purposefully our ministry, but, you know, whoever God wants to love on, they get loved. Amen? All right, you should be in John 15 by now. Yep, thank you. All right. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13. Now let me read that again, it's just so good. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now this is the key. You're not supposed to love each other to your capacity. You're supposed to love each other to his capacity. In other words, you've got to take how much Jesus has shown his love to you and give that to others. Not give your best love, not give what you can muster up. But you've got to reach down inside and say, I don't have enough love. I need to find the Jesus kind of love so that I love one another as you have loved me. As you gave yourself for me. And then verse 13 says, greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, interesting, because that kind of goes sideways from friendship, I think. Don't you believe? Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. And then he says, you're my friends if you do whatever I tell you to. Right? That's what it says. It's clear. You do whatever. If You're my friends if you do whatever I tell you. I, I, I would think it was weird if a friend said that to me. Hey, you're my friend, but only if you do what I say. I'd be like, uh, that's not called a friend. That's, uh, that's called a slave. Well, the funny thing is, the next line he says something. Oh, because you were thinking that. He says, from now on, I don't call you servants. <laughs> and here's what he says. For servants do not know what the Lord does, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you that you should not that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit would remain that whatsoever things you should ask of my of the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I have commanded you that you love one another. Amen. So the interesting thing is, he says this thing about friendship, then he says, you got to do what I say if you want to be my friend. And this is what he's saying. I have the way that you should be believing for yourself, and if you're my friend, you're going to walk the same way I'm walking. It said this, how can two walk together unless they agree? Now, we're not supposed to be agreeing with each other. Like, hey, did you like my sermon? Hey, did you agree with all my points? Actually, my points aren't relevant to the story here. It's his points, and we got to decide what he's saying. 
And when he's saying what he's saying, we walk together because we walk with what he's saying. We don't see unity is actually bigger than unity. Unity of the faith is all about us walking in the singleness of heart of Christ Jesus. Not a church coming together under the vision of their pastor. I don't know if I was allowed to say that, but it just came out. I'm saying that because I want you to hear something different. It's not my desire that you do whatever I think is a good idea. It's my desire that we come into unity of following Jesus Christ in his lordship. Amen. If we're following Jesus, we're going to be walking the same way. And if we're following Jesus, we know that he's revealing things to us so we can walk in the fullness of what he has for us. Now, if we go the same way he's going, he's calling us friends, not because we're doing what he says, but because he's revealing his heart to his friends. In other words, he's not saying, do what I say because I said so. He's saying, do what I say because you know my heart and why I say so. My friends know my heart, and because you know my heart, you're going to do what I want. Because my heart is what the Father wants for you. Yeah, the Father knows best, and I'm giving you the heart of the Father, and because I'm giving you the heart of the Father, run for it, buddy. You're almost got, oh, you were so close. I'll tell you what, he looked back. He should have never looked back. So, this is really paramount because basically, basically Jesus is calling us his friends because he wants to do more than just be Lord over us. He doesn't want us to be his servants. Sometimes that's the way we need to think because we don't know how to obey anybody. I was very rebellious in my, in my growing up and um, I actually like to see how much I could get away with. I did crazy things. Um that really could have got me in a lot of trouble. And um, and thankfully, God spared me. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go any further than that. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> I was just thinking of one, and I was like, what craziness. Um, but, but God is so good to us. I think we all have stories we could tell about how God was faithful to us even when even when when we were at war with him. And so God wants to reveal his heart to us as friends so that we won't feel like he's bossing us around and telling us what to do. And you know what when when we when we come together in unity, we'll know that God's talking to us. We won't worry about, well, who do they think they are? We shouldn't be saying stuff like that in church. Who do they think they are? They think they're your brother, or your sister. Like, let's get over that stuff, right? I mean, I, it's funny how, how uh, you know, I feel like we're really getting out of the phase of, of needing to have honor. And honor's, honor's automatic in the church, but honor's not, impe- uh, like, imposed. Hear the difference? Honor should be automatic to every believer. Honor is part of who you are if you're a king. You don't sit there and walk around like you have no honor, but you... Honor's who you are. Honor's not what people deserve. Honor's who you are. You don't respect people that respect you. You respect people because you're, you're a person of honor. Like, but you can't impose that because you have a qualities of honoring people or you have co- qualities of respecting people. And then you say, well, you've got to respect. No, they don't even have to do that. And, and uh, if they're not going to respect you, they're not going to respect the Lord. So it's kind of like that. Really, really exemplify Jesus. And so, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the thing I really want to focus on as a close. Um, he says in that scripture, you didn't choose me, I chose you. This is actually something I learned uh, a long time ago. Um, that, not, that when... Someone in Jewish culture could disown somebody. In fact, someone in Jewish culture could say, my son's in such rebellion and bring them to the Sanhedrin and they would just take care of your son for you. They would take him out and the judges would come and they would throw rocks at your child till they died. 
That's what you could do as the parent. For, for you, you would bring your children and say that they just will not listen to me. But you could disown them, all these things. But when you chose a child to be yours, you could never disown them. All the legal rights were removed from you because they were somebody that you chose. Because you were, because you chose them, you actually couldn't disown them. You know how Jesus says, uh, you know, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He actually can't because he chose you. He can't because he chose you. And, and besides, that's not what love looks like. And so it's, it's wild when you think about these adoption, um, when the adoption principles come in, you say, I've been engrafted in. I've been taken in. He chose me even when I wouldn't have chose me. And so as we're, as we're getting ready to uh, really be around our families, some, some people, this is really challenging. I, I wanted Darlene Curry to testify this morning, and, and the Holy Spirit was just, just moving things. And, um, you know, for, for a couple years, she had gone through some things where her kids, she felt so uh, broken during the season because they all lived in different places, and she felt like she couldn't be with them, and all this turmoil. And I said, you know, why would you let the enemy steal anything from you? And just challenge to the core of who we are. This is, every day belongs to the Lord. You know, Christmas is no different. Christmas belongs to the Lord. I know, uh, by the way, if you're if you're anti-Christmas person, you know, I, I don't even really care about that stuff. I care that the world recognizes uh, Santa or Jesus, but almost everybody knows that Jesus is somewhere in there. And I would rather keep Christmas on the calendar then let the world take something else from the church. So that's how I kind of look at it. I'm really simple like that. Like, well, I'd rather have a Christmas on the calendar than no Christmas on the calendar. Like, rather it's uh, formed in pagan paganism or any of that stuff. It's nonsense. I celebrate the birth of Jesus, and the, most of the world does too. Some of them have a Santa Claus, whatever. And um, at the end of the day, when we're going around our family members, we need to come around them as Christians that have been made whole by God. And so anyone in this room, if you've been struggling in this season, one of the reasons why we open up our house is because we want people to be invited. We want people to find family again. We want people to find love again. But one thing we have to stop doing is getting around our family and staying broken and staying hurting. Because ultimately, our family needs to see the massive shift from us coming around and, and I'm all hurt and if they say something wrong to me. And, and it took me a while to get my own healing. So I, I understand the struggle and the progression. And it, might, it may not and oftentimes does not happen overnight. But if you start believing that God wants you to be the light in your family. In fact, when you get saved, your family begins to see what's transformed you. The most important thing you could ever do is let them see God arise in your life. Let them see the transformation. First thing you can do to make your family see something amazing about you is to apologize. I tell you what, I was so wrong about so many things. When I got saved, I started to, man, I thought like I thought my stepmom was the worst person in the world. And then I started thinking about what a kid I was. And I was like, yeah, she probably had a little bit of reasoning there that made sense. So I, I remember writing a big note to my stepmother apologizing for all the behavior that I had put her, all the things I put her through. And, you know, it's not really that hard once you want to make things right. You don't care what it takes. So I just challenge you guys with family this week, uh, this whole week coming up. That you just reach out and love somebody like like you maybe never could have in the past. You break down all, you know, they might come back snarky with you. Be prepared. Be prepared. Oh, you know, every time I say something to them, they're smart, Alice. Oh, guess what? Be ready. It's okay if you don't, all you have to say is, it's okay, I love you. And, and you know, if you just keep watching. Jesus is getting a hold of me and it's, it's so beautiful. I, I can't wait till you get to meet him. If they're if they're if they think they're saved, then be a little bit more careful than that, because <laughs> then they might get snarky again, and then you gotta be careful not getting stuck in that trap. So, um, as you guys are 
are just uh, contemplating what all God's done this year. There's a lot of amazing faces in this room, and I'm, I'm really excited about all the things that have happened. Um, and and I was I was kind of the, if you guys didn't get to see the letter that we sent out by email, I know sometimes um, bulk letters go into um, like promotions and spam and all that stuff. And so so we put it on Facebook so you could read it because I really took took some time and prayed and thought about everything God's done this year. I mean, we've seen some incredible transformations. We're gonna have a couple of them share at the New Year's Eve service. I'm, and, um, you know, this New Year's Eve is our seventh year anniversary as a church. Three years, almost three years here. Uh, almost just three three years here and we're having our own church. And and uh, another thing that was really awesome is it will be 19 years with my wife. It will be our anniversary too. So next year, actually next year, ne- next year we're getting, uh, we're getting, I don't know what they call that, uh, we're doing our, wedding vows all over again so yeah so I'm really excited about that so we're gonna have we're gonna have by the way we had a uh, I think we had an $800 wedding both my kids decided to go wild I was like well I'm glad you got it like that bro because <laughs> we we didn't have it like that so we we had an $800 wedding and um you know I still got I still got my nice ring here you said it wasn't even $800 The wedding was free, and our wedding rings, yeah, our wedding stuff was, yeah, anyway. It was, uh, we, we, were, we came from very, very basic beginnings, and we're very grateful for the Lord, um, you know, teaching us a lot of things along the way. And so I'm very grateful for you, honey. And I'm grateful for you as a church um, supporting us and praying for us. It's, it's been quite an awesome adventure. It's been amazing to see some of the, the healings that's happened this year. Many transformed lives. Uh, the, the people in the houses have come, uh, like, uh, we have the best uh, people in all of our houses that we've ever had because the church is uh, growing, and, and some of you guys have been able to pour into their lives. There's a lot of reasons for all that, and, and you should be proud that you're part of a, a community that's transforming lives, that's seeing people restored and, and redeemed. Families are coming back together. We've helped a couple marriages this year, um, so it's really exciting. Uh, one of them was a pastor friend of ours. We got to restore their marriage. So in this year, we've seen incredible things happening. And, and I just want you to say, uh, just take the time. Because I didn't think it was quite as exciting as it was until I started really looking. And then I said, wow, a lot's happened in this year. And so I'm really grateful for you guys, uh, especially the people that are giving their life uh, for prayer, um, intercessors, uh, for prayer house people. Um, for people to stay for night watch prayer, I want to just say thank you because I still I, I believe and I know for a fact that prayer actually uh, paves the way for a lot of supernatural things to happen for us. And so keep on praying. If, uh, if that's not been something in your diet is a lot of prayer, then get back in the habit of setting aside time for individual prayer and time for corporate prayer. So uh, that'll be really important in the new year to, to stir up the gifts of God on you. Do you have anything to share before I close? Oh, Bunny got. No, ma'am. I think Chris, Chris, did you? Nice and loud. it's really been on my heart the Lord's been speaking to me all week about the forgiveness and about not you know I was sharing this with a couple people already about not when, when people act or react or say things not assuming that we understand their hearts especially if it's something that takes us in our own heart in a certain way in our head you know to really just go and ask them you know what did you mean by that you know did you mean to like snap at me, because a lot of times it could very well be that maybe someone didn't mean it at all and they just didn't get any sleep last night. Or they were hangry. Or, or they were hangry? Yeah. What's hangry? See, I got a witness over there. Okay. Well, but hungry so, and angry. So 
So a lot of times what I wanted to evaluate before we get ready to cross into the new year as well is in my own personal life, looking back over all the goodness of God this whole year, Amen. the mercies of God, the amazing presence of God, and then looking and asking, like, these couple things, Lord, that you keep dealing with me in, and things feel like they just keep repattering, you know, like, like they keep repeating themselves, you know. I think maybe I'm going this direction, and then it feels like I, you know, in this particular area, I fall right back on my face again. You know, asking God, like, I know what it is for me. Because he's, he's, he's requiring more of me. I know what it is for me. So I feel like in here there's some people that he's requiring more of you. Personally, intimately, relationship is what I'm talking about. And things that get in his way that take his attention away, there's two things in my life that just keeps happening. It's it's not huge, but you know what? It matters to me because he matters to me. So I just wanted to share that and just this whole week, you know, really ask the Lord. Ask him, what is it that you're requiring more of me? How? You know, that's what was really on my heart. Yeah, amen. We're going to start on time in about three minutes. We're going to kick off joy to the world. So everybody that's caroling with you, you want to give some direction real quick? Well, we're doing joy to the world first. Yeah. 